Good evening. There'd been quite a nice display of bright planets in the southern sky, rather low down. Jupiter, Saturn and Mars have all been there. Of these, the brightest is Jupiter, as befits its status as the giant planet. Mars is the red planet, still very bright, although it's now fading quite rapidly as it draws away from the Earth. But there's no doubt in my mind that the loveliest of all the planets is Saturn, now in the constellation of Libra. With the naked eye, Saturn looks like an ordinary, rather dull, first magnitude star. But telescopically, it shows that magnificent system of rings which marks it out. And that, in fact, is a drawing that I made a little while ago with the 15-inch telescope in my own observatory in Selsey. You can see there the main rings, which are separated by that black line known as the Cassini division. And you can see the shadows of the disk on the ring and the ring on the disk. And you can also see the rather faintish cloud belts which cross Saturn. They're essentially similar to Jupiter's belts, but not nearly so prominent. For a long time, we've known that those rings can't be solid or liquid sheets. They'd simply be pulled to pieces by Saturn's powerful gravitational pull. But it wasn't until the pass of Voyager 1 in late 1980 that we found out how remarkable those rings really are. And here is a picture of Saturn from Voyager 1. And as you can see, the rings are by no means straightforward. There is a Cassini division, all right. But you can see that instead of just two main rings, there are literally hundreds or even thousands of narrow rings and tiny divisions. And just why the rings are like that is something we still don't really understand. But this evening, I don't want to talk about Saturn itself or its rings. I want to talk about its main satellite or moon, Titan, which is a very remarkable world indeed. And telescopically, is easy to see because it's pretty bright. It's about the eighth magnitude. Now, this is a photograph taken by Commander Hatfield with his 12-inch reflector at Sevenoaks. There is Saturn, rings wide open. And that white dot you can see over to the left is Titan, pretty conspicuous. And uh, if you look much closer to Saturn, reckoning as a clock face about one or two o'clock, you'll see two much fainter satellites, and they are Rhea and Dione. But Titan is preeminent, very much larger than any other moon in Saturn's system. And uh, when it uh, passes across Saturn, you can even see it in transit, and sometimes you can see its shadow. Now, this drawing was made by Paul Doherty, actually with my telescope, some years ago when the rings of Saturn were not so well placed as they are now, we were almost edgewise onto them, and the rings weren't well seen. But there, to the left of the planet, you can see the white dot that is Titan, and that black spot against Saturn's belt is the shadow of Titan on the disk. Now, Saturn, remember, is a long way away. Its mean distance from the Sun is 886 million miles. And if you can see Titan as clearly as that, well, Titan must be fairly large. And certainly it is much the biggest of Saturn's satellites. But it's not the only one. There are plenty of others. In fact, a grand total of 20, as that's now known. Uh, some of them are very small. Uh, I've not shown the very small inner ones here, but we have the orbits of Tethys and Dione, and then Rhea, which is nearly 1,000 miles across, then Titan, and beyond Titan we have a small one, Hyperion, and uh, beyond Hyperion we have two more satellites, a fairly large one, Iapetus, and then a very small, strange one called Phoebe, which goes round Saturn the wrong way, rather like a car going the wrong way round a roundabout. And Phoebe is, I think, an exception, because it seems to be rather darkish, and uh, also it may well be a captured asteroid and not a genuine satellite at all. But of all these satellites, Titan's much the biggest. And I think it's interesting to show you the size of Titan compared with some of the other planetary satellites and some of the smaller planets. So here to start with, uh, in the top left-hand corner, we have Mars. Now, Mars, the red world, diameter just over 4,000 miles. That's roughly half the diameter of the Earth. Mercury, 3,000 miles. And that's the smallest of the big planets, unless we include Pluto, which seems to be in a class of its own. And our moon, just over 2,000 miles across. Underneath, we have the three biggest satellites of Jupiter, Ganymede, Callisto, and Io. And as you can see, Ganymede is a bit bigger than Mercury, and Callisto almost the same size, and Io just a bit bigger than our moon. And then Titan. Now, Titan is the only big Saturnian satellite, uh, almost equal in size to Mercury. And then we come down to oh, 900 or 1,000 miles, Iapetus and Rhea, half that size, Ione and Tethys, and then the very much smaller ones, such as Hyperion and Mimas. And so, quite clearly, the system of Saturn does differ markedly from that of Jupiter. And um, most of Saturn's smaller satellites are icy and cratered. And we, of course, we do now have views of them from Voyager. 
Look at Iapetus. That's the outer major satellite, much smaller than our moon, an icy cratered surface with a strange dark stain that we don't really understand. And uh, here is Dione, very much smaller still. And that looks superficially rather like the surface of the moon. But it's not, because although both the moon and Dione have craters, a Dione surface is icy, and the moon's, of course, is rocky. But Titan is in a class of its own. And uh, that was realized a long time ago. And uh, as long ago as 1908, an atmosphere was suspected by the Spanish astronomer Comas Sola. And uh, he based this on observations of what we call limb darkening. Titan's edge, or limb, appears darker than the disc near the center. Let me show you why. Here we have a diagram. That white disc is the actual body of Titan. Around it, shaded, we have a layer of atmosphere. Just imagine you're looking from the right-hand side of the picture. Now, it's clear that the light from Titan's limbs, that's either top or bottom of the white disc, is coming to us through a fairly deep layer of Titan's atmosphere, and therefore some of the light is going to be absorbed. Whereas the light from the middle of the disc is coming through a shallower layer of atmosphere, is not so absorbed, and so the middle of the disc should appear brighter. And through a telescope, that is exactly what you see. And there's a drawing of Titan made by Paul Dirty, actually with my telescope, and you can see the limb darkening there very distinctly. The center of the disc is much brighter than the edge. So that was a pretty good indication. And in 1944, Gerard Kuiper spectroscopically actually discovered the atmosphere of Titan. And there was no doubt that an atmosphere existed, but we didn't really know what it was. We thought probably the main constituent was methane or marsh gas. And at that stage, we also believed that the atmosphere of Titan was liable to be, well, very much less dense than that of the Earth, and probably no denser than that of Mars, which by our standards are very thin indeed. But all the same, that was significant, because no other natural satellite in the solar system was known to have any kind of appreciable atmosphere, and that is, is still true today. So Titan proved to be an exception. But that was really about as far as we could go until November 1980, when Voyager 1 made its pass of Saturn and Titan. Now, Voyager 1 was a two-planet probe. It first of all made a pass of Jupiter and sent back those magnificent pictures that we showed at the time, you may remember. It then went on to make a bypass of Saturn. Now, it had two tasks there. It was due to image Saturn and also get back information from Titan, which was regarded as so interesting, it was practically as important as Saturn itself. Now, if Voyager 1 took in Titan, it could not go on to the outer giants, Uranus and Neptune. It would simply pass out of the solar system, and that would be that. Therefore, if Voyager 1 failed to image Titan, then Voyager 2 would have had to have done so, and that would have meant missing out on Uranus and Neptune. And uh, everyone devoutly wished that that would not happen. Well, in point of fact, it didn't. All was well. Voyager 1 did get images of Titan, and therefore Voyager 2 is able to carry out its full program. It's bypassed Jupiter. It has also now bypassed Saturn, well after Voyager 1, uh, without bothering about Titan, but getting pictures back of many of the other satellites. And it's now on its way to Uranus, which it will bypass in January 1986, and finally Neptune in 1989. So all was well. But Voyager 1's pass of Saturn and Titan was quite fascinating. I was over at the headquarters, the JPL, or Jet Propulsion Laboratory, at Pasadena, California. And that is the headquarters of the entire operation. And inside that is the DSN, or Deep Space Network. And that's really an incredible place, something straight out of Doctor Who. It's quiet and it's calm, but this is the nerve center, all the monitoring of the planetary probes, and it's monitored for 24 hours per day. Well, there was considerable excitement there as Voyager 1 drew in, and even more so, perhaps, in the press room, where I spent plenty of my time. We all wanted to know one straightforward fact. Would Voyager 1 show us the surface of Titan, or would the atmosphere be thick enough to conceal it? Well, opinions differed. I rather thought at the time that the atmosphere would not be thick enough to hide the surface, and we'd actually see surface detail. But uh, I was completely wrong. And as Voyager passed within 4,000 miles of Titan, it became very clear that we were going to see no surface details at all. And that was the kind of view we got, the top of a layer of what you can call orange smog. And the only really interesting thing you can make out from that is that the top part of the disk, that's the northern part, is appreciably darker than the southern or lower part. There was one lovely picture sent back, and that showed Titan as a crescent, looking rather like a tiny crescent moon. Lovely, but not terribly informative. 
Then there was the question of the magnetic field. We thought that Titan might have a magnetic field. In point of fact, it hasn't, so far as we can tell, but it does move very close to the edge of Saturn's own magnetosphere. Now, Saturn does have an extensive and powerful magnetic field. It's much stronger than ours, although not nearly so strong as Jupiter's. And it so happens that Titan is almost on the edge of it. So as Titan moves around Saturn in this period of 16 days, it's sometimes inside and sometimes outside Saturn's magnetosphere. And whether that's significant or not, I don't know. But so far as details on Titan were concerned, well, we were, I'm afraid, limited to looking at the top part of the layer of atmosphere. And there's another very good picture, again showing the darker northern hemisphere and the lighter southern hemisphere. But we also were able to record the haze layers. And this, in fact, is a false color picture with the haze near the top uh, deliberately enhanced. And uh, when that picture was taken, Voyager 1 was about 270,000 miles away from the satellite. So just exactly what is that haze and what is the meaning of the darker northern hemisphere? It's interesting, you know, that uh, near the northern pole of Titan, there's what's called a dark collar, and that was shown on plenty of the pictures, and we don't really understand what it is. It could be some kind of seasonal effect, because the seasons there are very different from ours, and I suppose it could be linked in some way with the rotation. Titan, as I've said, goes around Saturn in a period of 16 days, and that's also the time taken for Titan to spin once on its axis. It's got what we call a captured or synchronous rotation, and it keeps the same face to Saturn the entire time, just as the Moon does compared with the Earth. In fact, most of the planetary satellites do that. The only one that doesn't, so far as we know at the moment, uh, is Phoebe, Saturn's outer satellite, which, as I've said, is probably a captured asteroid. But it was really the atmosphere of Titan which was the main surprise. We'd expected it to be fairly thin and made up of methane. We were wrong on both counts. First of all, the atmosphere is dense, denser than ours, and the ground pressure is about one and a half times the pressure of the Earth's air at sea level. Secondly, the main constituent is not methane. There is methane there, but only about 6%. And most of the rest of Titan's atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. Now, nitrogen makes up 78% of the air that you and I are breathing, which is very significant indeed. But also, the structure of Titan's atmosphere is by no means the same as ours and the surface temperature is very low. That's been measured at something like minus 168 degrees centigrade. And uh, above the surface, we have the methane clouds. Above that, we have a layer of aerosols, particles suspended uh, inside the atmosphere. And above that, we have the optical limb, which is about as far as you can see. And above that, the optical haze, which I showed you on that false color picture just now. And then at roughly 250 mi miles above the surface, we have a layer which absorbs the ultraviolet light. So that appears to be the kind of structure that Titan's atmosphere has. Now, and what about the interior? Now, so far as we can tell, the interior is made up of layers. There seems to be a solid, rocky core, which you'd expect, and surrounding that is a layer of soft ice, or water plus ice, probably with dissolved ammonia and methane in it, and outside that we have the rock ice crust. And it may well be that about 55% of Titan is made up of rock and the rest of ice. Now, the density, of course, overall, is very much less than that of the Earth, very much less than that of Mercury, so the escape velocity is only about one and a half miles a second. And you might think that that would not be enough to hold on to much in the way of atmosphere. But remember, Titan's a long way out, and it's very cold, and when the temperature goes down, then the speed of the atoms and molecules in the atmosphere is also slowed down, and it makes it more difficult for them to get away. And that's why Titan can retain a very considerable atmosphere. But what about the actual surface? Is it solid or liquid, or what is it? And it may be very significant that the surface temperature is close to what we call the triple point of methane. Now, by triple point, I mean that methane can exist as a solid, a liquid, or a gas, just as H2O can on the Earth as a liquid water, or ice, or water vapor. And that, as you can see, methane boils at minus 155 degrees, freezes at minus 182, so at minus 168 degrees centigrade, Titan's surface temperature is very nicely in the middle. And because the surface temperature is bound to alternate to some extent, you may have methane in any of those three states. And if we could look at it, we might find that Titan would be a weird world with methane clouds and a methane ocean and cliffs of solid methane, possibly with the globe of Saturn shining down very dimly through the orange sky, a scene utterly unlike anything else in the solar system. But if there is a methane ocean, how deep is it liable to be? 
Well, there are various ideas here. First of all, um, a shallow sea will cause a great deal of friction. That's why the Earth's rotation is slowing down very gradually. And if there's a shallow methane sea on Titan, well, that would cause a certain amount of friction, which would have its effect on Titan's orbit. Now, there is methane in uh, Titan's atmosphere, uh, and it's got to come from somewhere. And there's been a very interesting suggestion from two well-known American astronomers, Carl Sagan, whose name you'll certainly know, and his colleague Stanley Dermott. They point out that as there is methane in Titan's atmosphere, it must be replenished from below, and that does indicate the presence there of a methane ocean, possibly with other constituents such as ethane and acetylene as well. Now, if that ocean were shallow, then Titan's orbit would have been modified in a way that apparently hasn't happened. Therefore, they suggest that the methane ocean may be really deep, possibly as much as a thousand feet deep, with waves 30 feet high sweeping round the surface every time Titan moves round Saturn. And that, of course, would not set up so much friction, and it could well be, therefore, that the methane ocean on Titan really is deep. And that would give Titan about 200 times as much gas as the Earth has. And it also may mean that if there is a big ocean there, that when probes go there, they may, in fact, uh, need to carry something more in the nature of a kind of cosmic submarine than an ordinary landing probe. But that, I'm afraid, lies in the future. We've no hope of finding out yet. But what about the possibility, then, of life? Well, all the ingredients for life are there. There are certainly organic, uh, organic substances. The one stumbling block is, of course, the very low temperature. It's hard to imagine life of our kind getting going at a temperature of something like minus 170 degrees centigrade. And it's been said that Titan is rather like an Earth in the deep freeze. On the other hand, things won't always be the same, because the solar system's not going to stay the same. At the moment, our sun is a steady, well-behaved star, shining quite steadily. But it won't always be so. In something like 5,000 million years from now, the sun is going to change. It'll use up its available hydrogen, and then it'll swell out and become a red giant, and there'll be a time where it's sending out something like 100 times as much energy as it does now. And that's certainly going to spell the end of life on the Earth, if not of the Earth itself. And Titan will warm up. But does that mean that life will evolve? And I think the answer is no. First of all, it won't have time because the red giant stage won't last for long astronomically, and life is slow to evolve. And secondly, when the temperature of Titan goes up, then the speeds of the atmospheric particles will increase, and Titan's likely to lose its atmosphere. So I can't really see life evolving on Titan, either now or in the future. But nevertheless, it's a world unlike anything else in the solar system, and we very much want to find out more about it. So what are the chances? When Saturn and Titan come at their closest to the Sun and the Earth, as they will in the 1990s, we might get something from radar, but frankly, I doubt it. And I think our best probe lies in sending up a probe, a special Titan probe, to go round Saturn, much as Pioneer is now going round Venus, uh, probing the atmosphere and possibly dropping packages onto the surface. That's bound to happen one day. It's not been funded as yet. And when it is going to happen, I don't know. But until then, I rather fear that we are not going to learn a lot more about Titan than we know today, which is a pity because it's unique unlike anything else in the solar system, and it may have many problems remaining to be solved. So um, do go and have a look at it with a telescope if you can. Turn your telescope towards Saturn, and there you will see Titan as a tiny star-like point. And it's going to require some effort of the imagination to picture the scene beneath those gloomy orange methane clouds. Good night. of the sky.